he's found, guys. Green one on the left side there. Red one on the right side. 231. 231. Don't let nobody come up here. Don't want nobody in here. The police in West Memphis, Arkansas, confirmed today that three young boys were brutally murdered. The bodies of Weaver Elementary School second graders Stephen Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore were pulled from a shallow creek earlier today. There are rumors that the boys may have been sexually mutilated. The police say that they do not yet have any suspects in the case. The missing eight-year-old boys were discovered in an area known as Robin Hood Hills, a secluded patch of woods behind the Blue Beacon truck wash along Interstate 40 in West Memphis. Imagine all the evil that you could think of, the how someone could be murdered. And that's how these three children died. No family should have to go through this. Unfortunately, it's going to happen again somewhere. Another town. It's going to happen again, I'm sure. A lot of bad people out there in the world. I don't know why these three little boys were murdered. Did they see something they were not supposed to see? Did they hear things they were not supposed to hear? I, I do not know that. I see no reason. I, I see no motive for why these three little boys were murdered. Live from KAIT 8 TV, good neighbors you can turn to for news, weather, and sports. Tony Brooks, Diana Davis, Terry Wood, and Dick Clay. This is KAIT 8 News. Good evening, I'm Diana Davis. And I'm Tony Brooks. In a statement given to the police and obtained by a Memphis newspaper, 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly allegedly confesses to watching two other suspects choke, rape, and sexually mutilate three West Memphis second graders. Jenna Newton reports. According to the published report, Miss Kelly told police he watched 18-year-old Damian Eccles and 16-year-old Jason Baldwin brutalize the children with a club and a knife. The report says Miss Kelly told police Eccles and Baldwin raped one of the boys and sexually mutilated another as part of a cult ritual. Miss Kelly is quoted as saying he did not take part in the rape and mutilation, but that he helped subdue one victim who tried to escape. At a press conference, Inspector Gary Gitchell said the case against the accused teens is very strong. Scale of 1 to 10, how solid do you think the case is? 11. <laughs> <laughs> It appears satanic worship may have played a role in the murders. Since the very beginning of the investigation, people all around West Memphis have come forward with stories of satanic cults. Reverend Tommy Stacy's church is down the street from where the bodies were found. One year ago, Damian Eccles told the church's youth minister he had a pact with the devil and he was going to hell. Uh, I do know that my youth director uh, talked to Damien extensively after revival that we had, and he told him that he could not be saved, that he could not uh, give his heart to Jesus. And my youth director then tried to get him to take a Bible, and he made the statement that he could not take a Bible because if he did, the rest of them would get him. In West Memphis, Jenna Newton, KIT 8 Night News. Christopher never hurt anybody. He had a gentle, loving, and giving heart, and they crucified him in those woods. And they humiliated his little body. They took his little manhood before he even knew what it was. And I hate him for it. 
I never hated anybody in my life. And I hate these three. And the mothers that bore them. I can't imagine what was going through Michael's mind. You know, was he calling for me? How long did they leave him there tied up on that ditch bank before they decided to kill him? I mean, what were they doing to him? Was he, was he conscious or unconscious? Did he watch the other two boys get cut? He was really being killed by real monsters. First of all, what is uh, what are you holding in your hand? What's in my the... hand, um, it's Davy's Boy Scout. I got it back yesterday, and I've been wearing it around my head like this. <laughs> did he did he like scouting? Oh, he loved it. He loved it. Yeah, he loved it. Do you blame but... yourself for this? I have. I have. I've been. I've. I have been on a guilt trip about it, but. It wasn't my fault. I was at work. Have you contemplated joining Stevie uh, before your natural? Yeah. Have you thought about suicide? Have I? Uh, suicide? I, I felt like dying, but not suicide. You know, no, not suicide. Do you feel that the people that did this were worshiping uh... Satan? Yes, I do. Why? And just look at the freaks. I mean, just look at them. They look like punks. Jesse told me he didn't do it, didn't have anything to do with it. He wasn't there. And I believe him. I think the cops just can't find who done it. And they gotta put it on somebody. I wanna tell the whole world my son's innocent because I know he is innocent. I know where he was. And I know he's innocent, and I want to tell the world, and I want the world to know. This boy is not capable of the crime that he has uh, been arrested for. Uh, I've seen him take a little kitten and, and love it just like you'd, you'd love a little baby. It's like a nightmare, a nightmare that you can't wake up from. Our son is innocent. We intend to prove it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And I'm not scared of the devil. I know who my comforter is. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. And I thank you, Lord, for letting me be able to believe in that with all my heart. I hope you all really believe in your master, the Satan. Sleuth foot, devil himself, because he's not going to help you. He's going to laugh at you, mock at you, and torture you. He didn't need your help. The devil's got all the devils he needs. The good Lord said Lucifer and a third of the angels were cast from heaven. He didn't need them, but he took their mind and he manipulated them. And they prayed to Satan and they prayed to the devil. And they had their satanic worship services out here. And they had all types of wild homosexual orgies, I've been told. Crazy things. To me, this place as I stand is like hell on earth because I know that three babies were killed right out here where I stand. I know my son was castrated and possibly laid there on that bank and bled to death. I know he was choked. I know one boy's head was beat in beyond recognition. I know one little boy was skinned almost like an animal. 
cut, had to shave his head, had all types of injuries to the head where they just kept beating and pounding on him and killing him and killing him. It's like they enjoyed it. They killed him two or three times. Jesse Miskelly Jr., Jason Baldwin, Damian Eccles, I hope your master of the devil does take you soon. I want you to meet him real soon. And the day you die, I'm going to praise God. And I make you a promise. The day you die, every year on May 5th, I'm going to come to your graveside. I'm going to spit on you. I'm going to curse the day you were born. And I'm sure while I'm standing there, I'm going to have to have other bodily functions let go upon your grave. I promise you, as God is my witness, I'll visit all three of your graves. The statement Jesse gave to the police is, is a lie. It's not true. I don't, I don't see why he would do something like that to another place. I can see where they might think I was in a cult because I wear Metallica t-shirts and stuff like that. But. I'm not in nothing like that. I couldn't kill an animal or a person. I don't worship the devil or anything like that. I worship God, you know, like everybody, every normal person in this, around here does. I got a favorite pet, a pet iguana. I've had him for a little over a year now. Well, I usually go fishing by myself right in my backyard. Go out there and my pet cat will be out there. His name's Charlie. And whenever I catch a fish, I just give it to him. I didn't kill these three little boys. I didn't kill those three little boys. They were under a lot of pressure. They had to find somebody to lay this off on before people started losing their jobs. And the public was getting real upset, saying the cops were incompetent, couldn't do their job, so they had to do something fast. And we were like really the obvious choice because we stood out from everybody else. So it worked out to better advantage. No one's going to be saying that you're stupid or that you're dumb or, or, or making fun of you. But the court's going to be very interested in determining exactly at what level you are functioning, uh, how well you're able to read, how well you're able to write, things of that nature. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the court determines that, that uh, you are operating uh, below average, then there's a possibility that the court will not be allowed or the state will not be allowed to impose the death penalty against you. Do you understand what that means? Yeah. We've got about 10 weeks before the trial comes up in January. Mm -hmm. Are you looking forward to having the trial? For a little bit, not much. Hello? Operator, I have a collect call. Your name, please? Jesse. Will you pay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hey, sir. Hey. How you doing? Doing all right? That's I'm good. Doing all right. well, my hand still hurts. Your hand still hurts? Yep. Did you ever find out if it's broken or not? No, I ain't found out. It, I can move it. But well, if you can move it, it's not broke. It, 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 just, it hurts. Well, if you can move it, it's not broke. It's going to hurt for a while because you bruised it pretty good. You just got to learn not to hit them walls, hit somebody else. Jack's yeah. job. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just hit the... Well, I, hit I didn't you... hit the wall. I hit the commode. Hit the commode? Yeah, I hit it on the side. Well, you should hit... didn't even put it in it, did you? <laughs> so that must be a hard commode, man. I heard that. What time y'all gonna come up? I don't know. Y'all come up any time, because y'all be in here with me. Well, uh, we'll see you Saturday.
they're going to have to go through the metal detector when you come through the front door. Uh, every I want everybody to do that. They've got that portable thing that they can mm -hmm. bring from Little Rock if you need it. I mean, like the airport deal. But we couldn't afford no three thousand dollar metal detector. No, so what I planned on doing was using two portables at this door. That's why I want all everybody outside of lawyers and. I wanted them to come through this door. There's a potential uh, 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 problem area w with the, the, the strong feelings of the family, and, and that's to be understood. So security not only coming in and out of the courtroom is, is a problem, but uh, keeping the onlookers and the family and, and, and people segregated from, from the, the accused is another problem that you'll, you'll have, darling. My intention was to bring this boy in before, long before court, and have him inside. Obviously, I'm very concerned about security simply because of the death threats and other things that have happened. But uh, I don't want to give the jury the impression if we have 20 state troopers and 50 county deputies, and, and uh, it's going to give the impression to the jury that, that my client is a very dangerous person, which he's not. And I don't want the jury to, to get the wrong impression. I don't want there to be such a circus in the courtroom with reporters and cameras that the jury forgets about what they're here for, and that is to administer justice. We expect the proof's going to show that this defendant confessed, that he was not coerced. Uh, the, we do not contend that the proof's going to show that every word that came out of his mouth was the truth. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this statement that Mr. and Ms. Kelly gave the West Memphis Police Department is a false story. The interrogation techniques that were deployed against Mr. and Ms. Kelly at the time of his statement on June the 3rd rendered him completely incapable. They, they broke his will. They scared him beyond all measure. The proof is going to show that this defendant was an accomplice to Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin in the commission of these horrifying murders. And we will ask you to return your verdict of guilty on three counts of capital murder. We don't know what the truth is, but when it really gets down to brass tacks, his daddy and I are going to look him square in the eyes and say, son, did you do this? Did, was you even there? That's when we will believe. Well, if he told me he did it, which I don't believe he did, but if he told me he did it, he'd have to do his time, suffer the consequences. If he admits to this, he would be strictly on his own. We no. wouldn't even send him a dollar for a pack of cigarettes. No, no, you're wrong there. Yes, we would. No, I would. No. He's but, my son. Uh, I'll send him money. But he will have to do his time. I wouldn't give him a nickel. He's my son. Now, we could be talking He's about... He's my flesh and blood. We could be talking about my son. Well? If my son did something that horrible that no I wouldn't give him a nickel let him suffer you can't turn your blood away I don't know how you say you could and we're gonna have a problem over this but I know how it is being up there in jail without anything uh -huh. well that's beside the point if he if he's guilty if he's guilty of doing this to these little boys no but he's not well I'm saying he's not too but if he happens to be, if it's proven, no, forget it, no, no. But I don't believe he did it. I never believe he did it. This is to Jesse Jr. Today's his 18th birthday, and I haven't seen him. I don't know where to go see him at. I want to sing happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Jesse, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Jesse. Happy birthday to you. And don't
don't smoke too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now he's legal to get him, ain't he? Yeah, he's legal to smoke now. <laughs> I may not be his biological mother, but giving birth don't make a parent. And I've had him since he was four. And it took me about a year to assure that little boy I was gonna be here for him. He wouldn't wanna go to school. He wouldn't wanna go outside and play because he's afraid I wouldn't be here when, when he come in. And when he's in kindergarten, if he happened to come in and I happened not be where he could see me when he first come in, he'd be hysterical when I got to him. And I've always known that he was, he had a problem. And I, I've always been real protective of him. Mom sent me this one. There are all sorts of sons. Sons can be slouchy, sons can be sweet, sons can be grouchy. He says, sons can be neat, sons can be broke, sons can be well today. But no son could ever be loved more than you. And says, happy birthday. Yeah, I cry a lot when I'm in here because I miss my family and everything. And, and I just cry a lot. And then after that, I go to bed, and try to sleep. My name is Ella Sanders. My son was Antonio Sanders. And he got killed Halloween night, 1990. My name is Brenda McLean, and my brother was stabbed to death. I'm Brenda East, and my son Robert, 23 at the time, was <clears throat> murdered in 1990. My name's Ann Wallen. My daughter was Sheila Elrod Dixon. She was murdered January the 12th of 91. I'm Wanda Rainey. My daughter was murdered June the 27th. We think, we're not sure. They're calling it a crime of passion. He not only throwed her out and let her lay two weeks, he poured acid on her to deteriorate her body. I didn't have the pleasure of telling my daughter goodbye. The funeral was closed casket. And this is what I had on the casket. And it's still very unreal to me. When the telephone rings, I expect it to be her. My name's Todd Moore. My son was Michael Moore. He was murdered along with Christopher Byers and Stephen Branch, May 5th, 1993. I cannot describe the pain that my family has went through. You know, they didn't just kill my son, they killed part of me. They killed a part of my wife and her daughter. I'm so frustrated because it seems like they have so much rights. We have no rights, like it had in the paper the other day. Now, taxpayers of Grittany County are gonna have to buy them a suit because they don't want them to go into court looking like what they are, criminals. They're in jail, they should wear jail clothes. Why do they need to have a nice suit bought by the county so they look presentable? They don't want them in shackles and chains. You know, these are not boys that murdered our kids. You know, they stopped being boys, you know, when they planned this. And I hear, I sit there and watch their parents and stuff coming out of court crying, talking about their son's rights. What about our son's rights? Where in the hell was his rights out on that ditch bank? He had no rights. He had the rights to be brutally murdered, be beat to death, a eight-year-old little boy. Where was his rights? I'm Diane Moore, Michael Moore's mother. Last week in, in Flash Market, the Eccles man was in there, staring me down like it was my fault that I had a child that his child could murder. We sat at Big Star, we seen the people that are supporting these people, that look at us like we're scum, and these other people are just the greatest thing that they've ever known. And now they want to have them all just dressed up and act like little choir boys in court and 
he go. He didn't do anything wrong. My son didn't do anything wrong. He's just a boy. Now, on June the 3rd, did you have a, an assignment to locate a particular person? My assignment was to uh, contact uh, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. At that time, was the defendant a suspect? No, sir. If he was not a suspect, why were you assigned to contact him? He was uh, a friend with uh, friends with Damian Eccles and uh, Jason Baldwin. What, if anything, did he tell you uh, during this conversation before the tape recording? Okay, he had told us that he had attended some satanic cult type meetings that boys along with girls would attend. There would be sessions of uh, sex, uh, orgies as he called them, uh, that dogs and animals had been killed and in fact those animals, portions of them have been eaten by the members. I believe is there's angels on earth. I believe there's demons on earth. And I believe as angels try to help people, I believe demons try to possess and hurt people to do the devil's will, just how angels try to help people to do God's will. Oh, worship the King, oh, glory. This time, Mark is going to sing a song entitled Whatever It Takes, a beautiful song. Y'all listen to him as he comes and shares. Mark? I believe the Lord is going to direct me, guide me, and lead me. And we're going to give the glory to him. There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree And it whispers, draw closer to me Leave this world far behind, there are no lights to climb And a new place in May you will find For whatever it takes To draw closer to you That's what I'll be willing to do For whatever it takes Thirty p.m. Jesse was sitting in the right down here. I had seen the police over there twice. I'd also seen little Jesse over there, and they had talked to him. He, he had talked to him. Police officer talked to him. Yes, sir. They had to find somebody to pin this on. This publicity was getting out of hand. Could you ask those folks inside to step out for just a second? Uh, I know that I've talked to to each of you, if not directly, indirectly. We need to be very, very careful about who we talk to with regard to the media involved in this case. There are several members of the media who apparently have no ethics and have decided that they're going to do everything they can to dig up mud and sling mud. It's not going to do anything but hurt Jesse and his chances of receiving a fair trial. You, as, as friends of Jesse and relatives of Jesse, are prime targets for these members of the press. And if we just remember the one rule is don't talk to anybody, then we won't have to worry about it. Does that make sense? So again, I'd, I'd caution you not to talk to anybody in the press because it's just going to hurt us. Thanks. For my will to break, that's what I'll be willing to do. That's what I'll be willing to do.
Ate it up. You know, one thing I like about this right here, black powder gun, is they can't pull any type of ballistics on it. If by some chance you was to shoot something with it, every bullet rifles through the chamber are just a little bit different. So they just can't pull no ballistics off this. There's a few people I wouldn't mind going on shooting with it, but hopefully the courts and the justice system take care of them. But they read prison, they gonna get took care of. No, Todd, I could save the state a lot of money. If they just let me line them three son of a guns up, I'd say this one here's for you, Jesse, and we gonna go for the jug of water. Oh, Jesse, I done blowed you half and two, son. <laughs> now, this one here's for you, Damien. You that black circle right in the middle. Oh, you got hurt. <laughs> Damn, that sure looked painful, didn't it? Yeah, hey, Jason, <laughs> I want you to smile and blow me a kiss for this one. Now, right, let's go back to Jesse. I just wounded him. I want him to bleed a little bit like he made my baby bleed. Oh, Jesse, <laughs> you know, that breaks my heart thinking about that scum. Because this right here is all that needs to be done to him. It just shot slowly with a real nice firearm. And it ain't got no consideration or no feeling of who it's aiming at, just like they didn't care about killing my baby. I'd be happy with lining them up. I wouldn't have no problem with it. I think old Jesse's still kicking a little. Y'all go ahead and put him out of his misery. What, what, kind, of, what kind of range we got in the courtroom? Uh, probably about 10 foot right here. Go ahead and waste old Jesse. I don't see that to be in much of a problem. No. Because I can just see the scum. That's good. Go ahead, he's wiggling. All right. Oh, I can live with that. During the course of these conversations, was anything shown to the defendant? Yes, sir. All right. And what was shown to him? Okay, there was a picture that Inspector Gitchell showed him. Okay. And what was that a picture of? One of the victims. When I showed Jesse this photograph, he, he took it into his hand, and he just he just went back in his chair like this, and, and he just locked in on it, fixed in on the photograph, and just kept staring at it and staring at it. Initially, Mr. Miss Kelly denied any involvement whatsoever in this, didn't he? <coughs> yes, sir, he did. Officer Ridge, the photograph that was just introduced into evidence depicting uh, one of the boys' bodies, that was shown to Jesse? Yes, sir. And this was immediately prior to him admitting and telling you this story about being present when the boys were killed? Shortly before, yes, sir. Why did you guys do that? There had to be a reason to do that. There are times when Jesse would not be talking. He's, he's getting slower with information. He's, he's telling us things that are just, it's over and over the same thing. Those techniques are used to evoke a response. You and Inspector Gitchell did these things to invoke a response. Yes, sir. Invoke a confession. Invoke a response to keep him talking. Did it ever occur to you that uh, Mr. and Ms. Kelly has a mental handicap? No, sir, it didn't to me on that day. Did you have any special training dealing with people with mental handicaps? No, sir. Did it ever occur to you that, that this was going to scare him, showing him a picture of a body? <sighs> that it would scare him? I don't know. I, I guess he's scared into making a statement. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm getting nervous every day. Uh. Why? Oh. Why? Okay. That's a stupid question. Okay. Boy, I, boy, I can barely hold this phone. Boy, it's, it's getting closer and closer and closer. I know. I just, I don't want to even think about it. I can imagine what they're going to do to me. I can imagine. But I'm not going to think that, though. Think good thoughts, okay? Well, while I'm on the phone. Huh? Talk, to, talk about something good while I'm on the phone. Hey. Yeah? You're supposed to be talking to me, not your friends. Well, he's talking about something else. These people make me mad. You know it? Mm-hmm. They, they get to go out and screw people, and I can't. 
<laughs> you, what y'all do? I can't do that. Well, you will later. I will later? Mm-hmm. How do you know? I mean, if I can get out, we will. I but, know that. But if I don't get out, we won't. What I was going to ask you that last, that Sunday, mm -hmm. that I had a, I dreamed about you, mm -hmm. you won't believe what I was dreaming. It, it, it freaked me out. Want to hear it? Huh? Yeah. We was, we was having sex, all right? Okay. We went to, we went to the bathroom, we had sex. We were, when I was going somewhere, going, uh, going out the front door, we had sex right there. We done it out in the yard, in front of everybody. It freaked me out. I woke up, boy, I was sweating bad. I said, man, I hope that dream come true quick. What are you going to do when you get off the phone? Sneak back home. Go back home? Uh-huh. I'm going to go back home, too, when I get off the phone. I wish you could. Huh? I wish you could. Yeah. Well, my time's up, okay? Okay. I got to go, okay? Okay. Love you. I love you, too. Bye-bye. Those two ought to do fine. Yeah, I'm sure they will, but... Yeah, this one's good. This one came out. Okay. <sighs> Big difference from any other Christmas. You won't we'll ever forget. Yeah, no, it's the first one without him. Wish you could have been here to hear me sing lately. He liked to hear me sing, didn't he? Yeah. I think his little Christmas tree will stay there real well. It's in there tied enough. I don't think the wind will blow it over or anything. Come here and kneel down here by me. Let this happen. Please help us through it. God, please help us through this. This is a uh, enlarged photograph of the crime scene. This is the ditch where the bodies were found. Michael Moore was found in this area right here at the bottom of the screen. Steve Branch was found just just behind where these trees are in the stream, and Christopher Byers was found just below that body right here. This is Exhibit 22, which is the body of Michael Moore after removing him from the water. Way the front. This is the body of Steve Branch. Steve Branch is the young man that had the injuries to his face. Is it a particular part of his face? To the left side of the chin area. <clears throat> State's Exhibit 24, the body of Christopher Byers. And what kind of injuries did uh, Chris Byers have that you observed? It looked as though his penis had been removed.
Could you see the pictures from where you were sitting? Yeah, that's why I had to leave. Why? Because I, I always, along with seeing my little boy the way he was, I, was, I always had that picture of what he looked like in my mind. But you never knew until now. You were worried early on that, that, and you said early on, you really didn't want to know. But now you're hearing it. I mean, is it a lot harder than what you thought it was going to be to hear? It's a whole lot harder than I thought it would be. It's like going back to my fifth and reliving it all over again. This is Detective Brian Reed of the West Memphis Police Department conducting an investigation for the offense of triple homicide, case file number 9305-0666. Currently in the office with Jesse Lloyd and Miss Kelly Jr. What occurred while you were there? When I was there, I saw Damien hit this one, hit this one boy real bad. Then he started screwing him and stuff. All right, you've got in front of you a picture that was taken out of the newspaper, I believe. It's got three boys, and these are the three boys that were killed on that date in Robin Hood Woods. Which one of those three boys is it you say Damien hit? The third picture, which will be this boy right here. Yeah. All right, that's uh, the buyer's boy. Christopher. That's who you're pointing at. So you saw Damien strike Chris Byers in the head. Right. What did he hit him with? He hit him with his fist and bruised him all up real bad. Jason turned around and hit Steve Branch. Okay. And started doing the same thing. Then the other one took off. Michael uh, Moore took off running. So I chased him and grabbed him and held him to they got there and then I left. Inspector Gitchell, let's talk about the things that, that Jesse told you that are just absolutely incorrect. Now on page nine of his statement, Inspector Gitchell, Jesse says that the murders took place around noon. How did you know that was incorrect? Because the boys were the young boys were still in school. Did at any time when he was telling you this, these things that you knew were incorrect, did it ever occur to you that what he was telling you was false, his entire story was false? In Jesse's case, I feel like he did tell us a good bit of the truth, but then they also lessen their activity in a statement. That's uh, just common, at least in my 20 years career. Is it common for the police to simply ignore these big obvious problems and just assume that everything else that he's telling you has, has got to be correct? Uh, Jesse simply got confused. Well, if you and I can tell the cops that we know what our rights are and uh, basically go to hell, we're not going to sit here and take this and walk out. Jesse Miskelly has no concept of being able to leave a police station. I mean, the only thing that the, the prosecution has, has put on against Jesse is this wild story that he told the police. And I hope that the fact that there's no physical evidence linking him to the crime scene is, is going to have a lot of impact on the jury. And when we're talking about reasonable doubt. Uh, but, but I think you need to deal with the lack of physical evidence, not just not, not to just let them get away with the fact that they were in the water and it all washed away. A crime scene that clean has to be purposefully planned done that way. Okay? That, that, that the fact that it looked washed down was not just happenstance. Right. Okay. That 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 that. That's probably something like you said. We can maybe that somebody use... somebody somebody intentionally, purposefully, with great cunning and intelligence, tried to get a, get rid of every spot of blood, semen, uh, uh, mud, footprint, you know, anything that may have been there. They purposely tried to get rid of all that. An 18 and a 17 and a 16 year old kid don't pull us off. No, a lot of, I think there's a lot of professional killers they, who don't leave it this clean, you know. I really do believe that if the jury hears what lust serial killers are like and what they do and how they leave crime scenes, the missing evidence, the souvenirs, I, I have no doubt that there's a serial killer running around that, that did these murders. I, I don't have any doubt about it. Hell, he may be in Idaho now, but I mean, but you know, I, I don't have any doubt about it, you know. you know. It is somebody who knew what they were doing, had, had done it before, and probably has done it since then, or will definitely do it again. Are you aware of any personality traits of people who are likely to possibly confess? Low IQ, highly suggestible, 
always attempting to solve the immediate stress factor, get the interrogators off my back and just let me go home, naively assumes that they can all straighten it out later on. It's extremely difficult for the average person to believe that someone would confess to a crime they didn't do. And what I didn't like about this confession is that most of it emanated from questions right off the bat without, without any narrative of any, any length at all, without any descriptions uh, about feelings or conversations or anything. I, I just don't understand uh, if he was in fact involved in this crime, how he made a mistake on the time factor. And the thing that really bothers me is the ligature, what was used to tie up the, the victims. Now, he certainly knows the difference between uh, shoelaces and a rope. That should have been a, uh, a signal that something was radically wrong. That's when uh, the question should have been more probing to determine whether or not he was making it up or giving a valid confession. Out of the hundred or more people that y'all talked to, are you aware of anybody other than the defendant who told you one of the victims that had their genitals removed and one of them had cuts to the side of the face and it had been some grabbing of the ears? Uh, there was no one else that mentioned those particular injuries. And you yourself, Mr. Fogelman, you're pointing to the wrong side of the cheek. Oh. <laughs> Was there any kind of emotional response? He had tears coming down his eyes. Right. Had y'all yelled at him or been mean to him or no, threatened sir. him or promised him anything, done any of those things? None of those things happened whatsoever. All right. Dr. Offset, could you give us some examples of, of the police being coercive, leading, or suggestive during the course of the interrogation? Yes, I can. Perhaps the most powerful example, in my opinion, is the example of the eight revisiting of the question of the time at which the killings occurred. The first example occurs on page three. Detective Ridge says, all right, when did you go with them? Mr. Miskelly says that morning, Detective Ridge asks, I'm not saying when they called you, I'm saying what time was it that you were actually there in the park? Mr. Miskelly says about noon. Detective Ridge now says, okay, was it after school had let out? This is immediately after Jesse saying it's at noon. He's now suggesting it must be later by saying, is it after school let out? Jesse says yes. Detective Ridge follows up with his victory on page 24. And this time, Detective Ridge says, and I quote, OK, the night you were in the woods, uh, had you all been in the water? Jesse replies, yeah, we've been in the water. We were in it that night playing around in it. This is the first time in the record that it is directly suggested to Jesse that the correct answer is this happened at night. Immediately upon that being suggested, Jesse is, responds by accepting, and now he starts to use the word at night, where he had never used it before, that is an influence tactic. It is a way of getting someone to accept something out of pressure and out of suggestion. But that's one example. There are many other examples of manipulation on important points throughout this record. Mr. Offshay. Is your going right approximately $300 an hour? No, that's not. What is it? My rate is $150 an hour for consultation and $300 an hour for time spent in court or in deposition. So if you're initially asked to evaluate a case, you don't get to the $300 an hour 
unless you give an opinion that's consistent with what the person asked you wants to hear. If they don't call you as a witness, you don't get your $300 an hour, correct? Incorrect. I don't know what the terminology is in Berkeley, California, but when the defendant identified who it was who was castrated, when he indicated that one of the boys was cut in the face, you don't know and you can't give an opinion that any of those questions were coercive in nature, can you? No, I can't because the record that we are dealing with is very incomplete because this part of the record is preceded, as everyone agrees, by over two hours of interrogation in which many subjects were discussed for which we have no record. Jesse and Miss Kelly didn't tell the police anything that they didn't already know. They led him through this entire tape statement. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we don't know what happened before they turned the tape recorder on. They didn't videotape it. The officers didn't take notes on all the questions. They testified to that. They even testified they couldn't remember some of the things they asked him. How do we know what really happened? The defense, through bringing in so-called experts such as Mr. Offshay, have tried through smoke and mirrors to make it sound like a person that confesses to such a heinous crime and admits their involvement and gives you specific details of the involvement, that's indicative of someone who was forced or coerced to confess. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client, little Jesse Miss Kelly, is an innocent man. He's innocent. And I would ask you to go back to that jury room and bring back a verdict that rings of justice, truth and justice. And I would ask you to bring back a verdict that you can live with for the rest of your life. See this picture? This is, this is the more boy. This defendant won't look up. He won't look at you. But this defendant's actions, and you just think about it, if this defendant does not chase down Michael Moore, if he does not run through the woods and chase him down and bring him back, Michael Moore lives. Michael Moore gets to go home at night. His parents get to be with him. But because of this defendant's actions, because of what Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. did, Michael Moore's dead, Stevie Branch is dead, and Chris Byers is dead and there's no getting around it. I think when you go back and you apply your common sense and you do what's right and you think about the evidence in this case, you're gonna know that what the evidence shows is that this defendant ran down Michael Moore, that this defendant was there, 
he was involved and he's guilty of three counts of capital murder. Three, two, one. The jury went out at 420 this afternoon. They'll decide if Jesse Miss Kelly is guilty in the deaths of Christopher Byers, Michael Moore, and Stephen Branch. Miss Kelly is charged with capital murder and, if guilty, could get the death penalty. Two other teenagers charged in the crime will be tried later this month in Jonesboro. In Corning, Wayne Hoffman, ARN News. It's short but sweet. If I could twitch my nose and do that, I've been going a long We've time. We've been praying to God. Okay. There's still hope. That's right. There's still hope. I'm not giving up, though. No, 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 no,
Well, listen, it must be mixed emotions because you have the guilty verdict, but you, you still have the loss to deal with. This doesn't change anything. Our son Christopher's was still murdered. Dead. Our son and he was, was tortured dead. to death by three murdering bastards on a ditch bank. He was eight years old. And guilty is guilty. And I hope the little sucker, when he hits Cummins, they get his ass right off the bat because he deserves to be tortured and punished for the rest of his life for murdering three eight-year-old children. Jesse, how come you kept your head down the whole time? Jesse, you held your head down for the most Well, anything you want to say now? Did you do it, Jesse? You told you guys we were in a... Okay, so here's what you did. Okay, get this back, get a hold of it. Did you do it, Jesse? Prison's not a safe place. Jesse, sweetie, I'm gonna mail him a skirt. One down, two to go. Hopefully the same thing will happen to the next two and we'll get the same verdict. They found my son's testicles in a jar of alcohol in Damon Eccles' house with his fingerprints on the jar. Now, how do you dispute that? Some idiot started a rumor saying that uh, they found um, children's sexual parts uh, under my bed or in my house. And there was no body parts in my house or... Just, I think maybe the police had something to do with it, just because however, if they can make us look bad in front of the public, then people are going to kind of have their minds made up before anything ever comes out. What we want to talk to you about is all the stuff in the paper about a deal with Jesse. Um, we, right now, we don't know what his situation is, although we think that he is more inclined to testify right now than he has been at any point up to now. The Friday that Jesse was convicted, they questioned him, the officers who took him down inquired of him what had really happened, and apparently Jesse, contrary to somebody that was innocent that would say things like, gee, I've just been convicted and I didn't do it and what a terrible injustice. Jesse talked all the way down there about how he committed the crime and the specific details. Unfortunately, we need his testimony real bad. Um, if it was a perfect world, you know, we would take what we have on Jesse and leave it and we'd go and get the other two and get them and be happy, but it's not. And uh, we need his testimony to be sure we get convictions on the other two. I think we're going to negotiate his sentence down some in order to get him to testify. He's not going to, you know, testify just out of the goodness of his heart. The only way that I think that he will be willing to testify is if the life sentence is removed. Now, I do want to say all is not lost if he doesn't testify, uh, but the odds are reduced significantly. Uh, I mean, we've still got some evidence. What we've got, besides Jesse, <clears throat> is we've got a, a fiber that was found on, uh, I think it was found on Stevie's shirt that matched a fiber from Jason Baldwin's mother, which caused secondary transfer. We've got a fiber from a, a shirt, or a couple of fibers from a shirt found at Eccles' house found uh, one of them was on like the Cub Scout, Michael's Cub Scout cap, another one maybe on the shirt. 
uh, that match Damien's. Fiber evidence, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's better than hair evidence, uh, but they can't say that it came from that particular garment to the exclusion of all others. Uh, we've got uh, the Hollingsworth clan that says they saw Damien and Dominique out on the service road. We've got some um, uh, kids that say that Damien, at a, they heard him at a girls' softball game, overheard him say that he killed the three boys and that he was going to kill two more before he turned himself in. And, and he scared them off yet like they did the other ones? Well, no, not yet. <laughs> We've got um, a guy that was in jail with uh, Jason who says that Jason made some incriminating statements to him. Now, there are some things that they w are going to try to do to attack this kid's credibility. But, um, oh, and then we've got the knife that was found uh, in the lake behind Jason's house. So that's what we've got, but that's all, basically, that we've got. And you ask what the odds were of convicting them without Jesse, and it's, uh, you know, 50-50 might be, might be good. The only way he'll come up there and sit down in that witness chair and testify is that they cut him a sweet deal. You take all the things that are wrong with his statement and then add to, the, add to that recipe mix that I'm talking now because I got a sweet deal and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get out in 10 years, hypothetically. I may get out in 10 years. Well, heck, who would have seen? You know what I'm saying? So he, then, he, then his evidence, his statement, his whole thing looks bad. And that's, if that's their best evidence, and trust me, it is, if they can't use that statement against you, they got nothing. And this dog and pony show is over. Good morning. Good morning. Are the rumors false about Jesse turning state's evidence? Yeah. Good morning. Is it true that Jesse's going to testify against Damien and Jason? It's false. I just left Jesse at the jail, and he told me that he was not going to testify, that he didn't, he didn't want to get up there and lie, uh, that the officers had been working on him real hard, but, but uh, he wasn't going to listen to him, and, and uh, this was his decision was final. But he can always change his mind again. I, you know, he has, and he's a very confused and scared kid, and, and the officers have scared him to death. Yeah, they have. Well, I told him last night, I said, Jesse, if you get up there and lie, I'm gonna be in that courtroom. And you're gonna have to sit there and tell that lie when you know that I'm sitting there listening to you, when you know I know the truth that you are lying. Damien, are you worried about Jesse testifying against you? In looking at young people involved in the occult, do you see any particular type of dress? I have uh, personally observed people wearing uh, black fingernails, having their hair painted black, wearing black t-shirts, Sometimes they will tattoo themselves. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not there are occult overtones or evidence of occult involvement uh, in these particular murders? Well, the date being close to uh, Beltane, what a is holiday, May 1st. All right. Also, uh, the day before that is Walpers Knot. Then you go into uh, the fact that some uh, groups, uh, occult cult groups, or, or uh, will use a full moon. Uh, <clears throat> in several occult books, they will talk about the life force of the blood. Usually the younger the individual, the more pure it is, the more power or the force it has. A lot of times they will take blood and store it for other services and other use, as well as consume it or bathe in it. 
Now, the, the uh, item that's drawn on the front, uh, what is that? That is, a, that is a pentagram. That happens to be a Wiccan or, or white witchcraft pentagram. All right. Now, if you had opened the book to the front page. Yes, sir. Now, explain what that is. That's confusion to me. All right. And the reason why we got a, a white witchcraft uh, Wiccan pentagram, then we have upside down crosses, which comes from another type of occultism. What type of occultism do the upside down crosses That's black come? witchcraft. Is it Wicca, Satanism, or both? Both. Okay. And did you notice anything in particular uh, about the book? There's a chapter in here called Rise of the Devil, and uh, it is underlined in red, and there, there's a couple sentences in there reference to uh, blood and its life force. How, how were you accepted into enrollment at Columbia Pacific University? I had to fill out a... Uh, considerable series of papers, including all my education, background, experience. Did you ever fill out a little flyer like this? No, sir. That says, call toll-free for information on how to become a doctor? This is a mail-order college, isn't it? What classes did you take between 1980 and 1982 to obtain your master's degree? What, cl what classes? I testified. I'm asking, yeah. what classes? What classes did you I, take? I told you, I answered that before, none. You did not take any classes. Between 1982 and 1984, when you became a PhD, what classes did you take? None. None. Okay. Is it your opinion, and do you want to tell this jury that these crimes were motivated by occult beliefs. Yes. We're not trash, by no means. My son was born in West Memphis. He was raised in West Memphis. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why people has got this bad image of him. So what if he wore a black trench coat He's not the only one that does. You know, so what if he wore black T-shirts, black pants? Johnny Cash wears black, doesn't he? Well, I wear black. Michelle wears black. Uh, Dominique wears, wears black. black. <laughs> it's, we're all just partial to black, I guess. I like black myself. And I'm by no means no devil worshiper, nor is he. He was going to school. He wanted to go to school to be a priest. He was faithful in the church. And he looked into a little bit of Wicca, but he, he never went to it. And I think if people looked into what, to what Wicca is, they would understand it a little better. The only thing Wiccans do is worship the earth. People probably think that I'm in Satanism because usually what people don't understand, they try to destroy or ridicule it, try to make it look bad or wrong. West Memphis is pretty much like second Salem right now because everything that happens there, every crime, no matter what it is, it's blamed on Satanism. Been previously sworn. Yeah. Yes, sir, that's correct. Please state your name for the court. Damian Wayne Eccles. Why did you change your name? I was very involved in the Catholic Church, and we were going over different names of the saints. St. Michael's was where I went to church at. And we heard about this uh, guy from the Hawaiian, I Hawaiian Islands, um, Father Damian that took care of lepers. 
until he finally caught the disease itself and died. Was that the reason you chose Damien as your first name? Yes, it is. Okay. Did the choosing of the name Damien have anything to do with any type of horror movies, Satanism, cultism, any of that nature? Nothing whatsoever. Okay. All right. After the time period that you were really into the Catholic religion, did you start focusing in another particular religion? Wicca. Wicca. All right. Could you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what some principles about the Wicca religion? Um, it acknowledges a goddess in a higher regard as a god because people have always said we are all God's children and men cannot have children. Um, it's basically like a close involvement with nature. Is there a difference between the Wicca religion and witchcraft? Wicca is also called witchcraft. The word uh, Wicca was bastardized. It originally meant wise one. Did the fact that you like to wear black all the time, were you different in, in other ways as well? Yes, I've never had a lot of the same interests that other people have, like sports, things like that. I've never been into anything like that. Okay. Did, it, did it help you deal with other people to have people kind of standoffish and sort of back away from you? Yeah, it would make, it was like a defense mechanism. It would make people think like, well, he's weird. I'm not going to go around him. So it kept people away. And the state had introduced the book Never on a Broomstick. Are you familiar with that particular book? Yes, I am. All right. Where did you get that book, Damien? At the library in Crittenden County. All the books that they were uh, getting tired of or had for a long time, I guess, they all had them sitting on a rack out front that they were selling for 10 cents each, so I got it. All right. Did you underline any of those portions in the book? No, that was done when I got it. I think it was because somebody had a report to do or something because all during the book there's like little notes, uh, certain dates and stuff, like from the 1600s in the outside margin. So was that book kind of like a history of, of witchcraft and, and yes. how it's developed over the ages? Yes. Okay. So are you familiar with the contents of that notebook? Yes, I am. I noticed on the inside of the front cover there, there appears to be a couple of quotes there. Can yes. you uh, read each of those to the jury and then tell them where that came from? Life is but a walking shadow. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's from A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Um, pure black, looking clear. My work is soon done here. Try getting back from me that which used to be. That is off a Metallica tape called Injustice for All. It talks about how warped the court systems are, mm, stuff like that. On May the 5th, did you kill Michael Moore? No, I did not. On May the 5th, did you kill Stevie Branch? No, I did not. On May the 5th, did you kill Chris Byers? No, I did not. Have you ever participated in any type of human sacrifice? No, I have not. 19-year-old Damien Eccles admits he stands out in a crowd. He says he loves heavy metal music, likes... Uh, <laughs> sure, but practices the Wicca religion. Three, two, one. 19-year-old Damien Eccles says he's... Three, two, one. 19-year-old Damien Eccles admits he stands out in a crowd. He says he likes to wear black most of the time, practices the Wicca religion, and loves heavy metal music, but he says he's definitely not a killer. I believe they did it, and if they were to be set free on the street, then they would have to look behind their back, watch behind their back to see if Pam Hobbs wasn't following them, because I'm just saying this as a human, you know, I, I would, I believe I'd try to kill them too if they ever walked the street and I'm still alive. I believe I'd, I'd be stalking them to do to them, probably shoot them and That's then cut them up. Me. When I was down at the courtroom and Damien walked past me, I wanted to just go over there and take my hand and just claw down his face inflict any kind of pain that I could inflict on him. 
I know eventually we're going to have to forgive them. I know that and I understand that. But when when it happens in your home and you watch your your wife lose her mind, you know, whatever happened to her, your home is tore apart, busted up. I don't feel it's fair right now to, for someone to ask me to forgive the ones that caused it. It it takes some time, a long time, before I could forgive them. You, you say that it's going to take time. We don't know uh, how much time we've got. Pam, we wouldn't be able to see Stevie again. We have to forgive in our heart because the Lord forgave us. He forgave us. He shed his blood for us. He shed his blood for them. And he just he just asked us to to have a a, a forgiving spirit. Now I refuse to serve sin and Satan. Because I'm gonna see Stevie again. I'm gonna be with Stevie again. I'm gonna be with my mother again. I'm gonna be with her mother, your grandmother, both of them. I'm gonna be with all of my loved ones that have passed on and went to heaven. If you could speak to the families of these these kids who think you did it, you know, what would you say to them? Jason was my best friend. We did about everything together. It was kind of like we even lived together most of the time. Stayed at each other's houses, wore each other's clothes. It was more like we were brothers. We used to go out and snake hunt all the time. Snakes and music were like about our whole life, really. We, list, we were like all the time looking for new groups that we would like or something. The, our favorite kinds of music were like Slayer, Metallica, Megadeth, mm. U2. Mm. We did just about everything together. Hey, I want to draw your attention back to August of last year. Were you in the Craighead County Juvenile Detention Facility? Yes, I was. Okay, and what were you in there for at the time? Burglary. Okay. And when you were there, was there a Jason Baldwin in the juvenile detention facility at the same time? Yes. Now, while you were in contact with this Jason Baldwin, was there anything mentioned about his involvement in the murders of the three eight-year-olds? Yes. Well, we were sitting there playing spades, and I wanted to get to know everybody off in there. Because I don't know what... To you call it, but I just wanted to get to know him. And I just straight out asked him if he did it, and he denied it the first time. Okay. Did you have an occasion again while you were in the detention facility to ask him, was he involved in the murders of the three eight-year-olds? Yes. I think it was like the next day. I believe it was the next day. And can you tell us what the scenario, what was going on, what was happening at the time that occurred? Well, me and Jason, Baldwin were scraping up the cards, going to our cells for lunch. I said, just between me and you, I won't say a word, uh, did you do it? He said yes, and he went into detail about it. You said he went into more detail. What did he tell you? He told me uh, how he dismembered the kid, or I don't know exactly how many kids. So he just said he dismembered them. He sucked the blood from the penis and the scrotum and put the balls in his mouth. Now, Michael, when was it that you came forward with this information? 
I'm not really sure. I believe it was like a couple months later. What caused you to come forward at that point in time? Why, why did Michael Carson no longer want to stay uninvolved? Why did you come forward in February this year? Because I saw the family on TV and saw how brokenhearted they were about their children being missing. And I got a soft heart. I couldn't take it. Now, he tells you this, and then you're silent from August until February. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then the second conversation you've ever had with this young man in his entire life, he tells you all this stuff. Yes, sir. After he's had one conversation with you. Yes, sir. One day when I was up here in Jonesboro working and phone rings, Secretary says, you won't know who he is, but he needs to talk to you. I pick up the phone. He says, I'm Danny Williams. I'm embarrassed to tell you what I need to tell you. He said, but I work with uh, the juvenile department here, and I do drug and alcohol counseling. And there's a guy named Michael Carson who's going to testify that Jason confessed to him in the jail, and I know he's lying. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he said, several months ago, Michael Carson was one of the kids that I work with. And he and I had a conversation where I told him that this Jason Baldwin had been accused of killing three boys and sexually mutilating them. And basically, he gave Michael Carson the details that he testified to at the trial. At the time, Carson says nothing. And then he later, Carson later tells him, he said, hey, by the way, Danny, I'm, I'm uh, telling the police that you know, Jason confessed to me. And so he calls me up and said, hey, no, no, no. I said, this kid's a liar. He's no good. I know he's lying. And the only reason he's got this information is because I gave it to him. Uh, the counselor of this kid called the prosecution and told them what a liar he was. And the prosecution still used the kid. That's right. And now they're trying to keep out the fact, the, the background of the kid. Obviously, we want to get that information out. But the judge acts like he may not let us use him at all. We should absolutely be able to uh, let that jury know that he is LSD dependent because it does affect his ability to recall. You know, the judge takes us takes all that away from us. Yeah, then the kid looks pretty believable. Not only are they are they keeping out the background of the kid when he testifies, so the jury doesn't have all the eggs, but now they're keeping out the counselor who even knows about this kid who told him the story in the first place prior to him ever telling the police. All that goes to the credibility. I think that would have shown the jury that he didn't have quite that kind heart, that uh, yeah, soft right. heart that yeah. uh, he tried to tell him. That's right. <laughs> Detective Allen, I want to direct your attention to uh, November the 17th, 1993. Were you asked to uh, make contact with some uh, property owners at Lakeshore Trailer Park and also get with the Arkansas State Police dive team? Yes, sir, I was. And uh, after a period of time of, of um, searching, do you know whether any items were recovered? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Mark, for identification purposes, is State's Exhibit 77, and ask if you can identify that. Yes, uh, I can identify this by my uh, uh, 1117 of 93 M. Allen that I put here. Where did I, you get the knife? I got this knife from a diver with the, with the state police. How long did this search take place? How long? Yes, sir. From memory, I'm thinking maybe 10.30 a.m. is by the time they got suited up and, and started, started to look. And you quit, you quit it when? <coughs> They located the knife at 11.35 a.m. So I had. Or 11.30, 11.35. About an hour. About an hour and a half. 